But I'm going to tell you first about this lady at breakfast. I will. I want to hear that. This is what this we should be doing. More interesting. Yeah. Okay. So lady I'm with a, breakfast. I'm at breakfast, and I sit like this sometimes. I actually turn around like a cat. You're sitting and, on your haunches. Yeah, like this. Yeah, got it. And then, it's, and it's oh, uh, yeah, because my neck's bad. Anyway, I order my food, and she's sitting over here, and then uh, a whole breakfast goes fine. And then when I leave, we're leaving at the same time, and I almost slipped by the crosswalk. So I go, I almost wiped out. <laughs> you were supposed to save me because she's just standing. I was talking to a total stranger. But I slid almost into the street, and I thought she might grab me by the scruff and save me. She couldn't care less. And she goes, oh, why do you sit like that? Okay, personal question. I go, oh, in there? Yeah. Um, well, my neck's gives me trouble so I don't and she goes oh I'm a massage therapist I go yeah so I just don't sit like that anyway nice to meet you I didn't bite she wanted me to go oh my god oh, she said she's a physical therapist no massage therapist oh massage therapist I see and she wanted me to go oh wow, oh this yeah. is kismet like you know it's like Reese's pe you put your chocolate in my peanut butter I go oh cool anyway so I just sit uh, sometimes I sit normal anyway oh light screen and then we get to the car and I feel guilty so when we walk when I'm getting in my car, she walks by and I go, it's tougher to sit like that in here. <laughs> she just kept walking. I go, I went Bomb. back to the same restaurant the next day. I said, how was yesterday? She goes, I had a haunch sitter. <laughs> Tried to help him, but he walked she away. Goes, I had some dope. I had a haunch sitter. You get haunch sitters in here and I know how to help them, but they just don't, they don't pay attention. When to people me. go, I think I but saw. But you said you were a big tipper. If they go, Spade, I saw him the other night. They go, oh, I don't think it was him. They go, does he sit on his knee? They go, mm. But that's but actually pretty good. You can sit tell. on your knees. Means your knees are in pretty she good shape. She did say, "Does it hurt your knees?" And I go, "No, the, the knee is the only thing that works." It's starting to go. What does that mean? Your knee's starting to go. No, my. All right, we don't have to <laughs> advertise the world. So our guest today is Non Johnny is actually an easy name for me. He's done a lot. Obviously, this uh, big sick movie, which was a huge, uh, not underground hit, what would you say? It was sort of a big Well, it's kind hit. of an indie hit, but indie it, it, hit, was, yeah. it got a huge splash. He, he won the Academy Award. He was nominated for an Academy Award for yeah. Best Original Screenplay. He gives a lot of kudos to Judd Apatow, his producer, and he's from Pakistan. And I didn't know that he left Pakistan at 18, mm -hmm. and then he moves to America, and uh, the, the story of his journey is yeah. remarkable, and uh, how he became this- Huge star in America. He's a brilliant stand-up, a uh, really smart writer. Yeah, sharp writer. Mm -hmm. Silicon Valley. Yeah, it was Talk a great all about one. that. Yeah, I'm working with Mike Judge. Specials. Mm -hmm. uh, specials and then how he got Pump You Up for uh, his, the movie called... The Eternals. Eternals. I told he you. He just decided to do that. And we talk about that and we get into how it affected his uh, relationship with his wife. Mm -hmm. It's a very interesting podcast, David. I've never had the experience of uh, having a girl say, oh, do you work out? Nothing like that. <laughs> not your muscles are too big, not anything's too big. It's just like, hey, man, let's, uh, you're, you're, you're what's known as a shoulder shrugger. So let's just get it over with and I can. Well, sometimes it's hard because, you know, the shirt comes off. And yeah. I knew a guy once who's man about town with the shirt came off. Mm -hmm. And then the young lady with him kind of said, oh, look, a tummy, and kind of <laughs> wiggled his belly. Oh, I think I've heard that. <laughs> You don't look fat. You just have a gut. I go, you, yeah. You're just soft like me. <laughs> yeah. Uh, when I look at you, it's like looking in a mirror. <laughs> that's, that's what girls say to me. I hope I don't weigh more than you. I'm like, these are all not compliments. I know. You love it, though, when they pick you up, kind of bridle going yes. across the we went in When we thing. walk into Chili's and they go, David. let me just carry you in. Yeah. I've seen you. Sometimes you're riding on their shoulders and you're running around the parking lot. I'm like, Mostly at concerts. <laughs> Uh, okay, this is it. <laughs> Craig's going, we can't use Say this. Say his name, ready? Here we go. And now you're listening to... Kamel Nanjani is our guest, David. Okay, here he is, that guy. You know, there's so many negatives that we could go into. Well, I don't want to spread rumors. Oh my God, guys, this is so awkward. I've been here for the whole time. I've been here for the whole time. Do you remember wh when we met? Of course I remember when we met. What are you talking about? I know. About? Check your diary. Why do you remember? Why do you remember when we met? I was kind of, That was a blur for me. Dan Harmon's podcast. Yeah. You know, which yeah, at, you were... at the comic strip. I didn't even know what I was doing. I was invited to go there and watch. And then they're like, hey, 
So I met you and a few others, but I was reminded by my son yesterday telling him I was going to interview you with David, and he goes, uh, or podcast with you, conversation. Yeah. Uh, he goes, you've met him. I go, oh, yeah, that's right. I remember meeting your son. Wow. Did, uh, uh, was it He's a so pleasant? much nicer person than was you, it, Dana. Was it a pleasant exchange? <laughs> it was very pleasant. You were very, very nice. Obviously, I've been a fan of yours for a long time, and you were very, very funny on the podcast, and you were very, very nice. And I told everyone I know, hey, Dana Carvey is actually very, very nice. Actually. Are, are we considered nice guys? I mean, David, David is a nice guy, but there's some people thought, I don't think they... <laughs> think anymore you're snarky you know <laughs> they for sure do they still remember that but he's a nice guy go ahead let let him talk let's hear what he has to say about me well i want to say outside of since i'm outside your circles yeah your guy's reputation as human beings is that dana is a nice guy okay yes <laughs> Anyway, we wanted to talk to you today about um. Well, I like this let it slide. I have to say, you are known as a nice guy because, well, Dana always was, but no one knows the real Dana. Yeah, but like I'm I, passive aggressive. I have a lot of anger. Don't don't you? Oh, I you know? do. Yeah, I do because we were both crazy families, and I was uh, not that tall. I'll never say the other word. I was not that tall, and I was picked on. They called me shrimp right. cocktail my whole life, and what so. Shrimp, shrimp cocktail? Yeah, shrimp Aww. cocktail. I, w I was vertically challenged, absolutely. Oh, it just brings um, back triggering Camille, things. Were you, were you, how big were you like when you were 12? <laughs> I'll tell you, this is great. By the way, I want to say, David, you're also considered a very nice guy. I was just joking. Okay, you thank you. No. Wonderful reputations among, you know, people outside your circle. I was, I, two things to that. One, I'm uh, like five, nine and a half. Okay. So in wow. Pakistan, where the average height is much shorter, I was one of the tall people. Oh, yeah. Um, okay. And then I moved to America and it was like I lost three inches. Suddenly. <laughs> yeah. I remember That's... I went to school and I got there early for an international student, like college international student orientation. And so it was us and the football team. Mm -hmm. And I remember standing in line behind the football <laughs> Bad team. scene. <laughs> Bad scene. The game has changed. Well, my dad was stationed in Japan and he didn't want to come back because he said he was 5'7 and a monster and that's the way to go. And he said, we should all pack up and go back to Japan. <laughs> he knew I was a fucking pipsqueak and uh, I would. I was lighting up like, is this, are you just joking? Are we going to go somewhere where I'll see him tall? And, you know, shrimp whatever. cocktail. I don't agree with that shrimp cocktail. <laughs> it was the worst and it was real. Hey. Go ahead, come on. Well, I'll tell you what mine was. I was very, very uh, small. Like I had very, they called me chicken shoulders. I had. Weird. So, well, what would have been your, give us a weight. So they you're 5'9 five, five, in high school. So, and how, what would be your lightest weight? Were you like 130 or something or 140? My, yeah, probably 130, maybe 120. I was very, very, I wasn't, I, you know, I, I had like, it was the worst. I had like a pot belly and no meat anywhere else. <laughs> At one twenty five nine, you have a pot belly. It's not the way that's, to go. That's low lean mass, man. No I, was, you have I was one twenty five, mostly head. <laughs> I had a very big head and a very tiny body for most of my um, adolescence. So, where's the energy and drive and sort of maybe normal comedian chip on their shoulder or underdog status that created? You coming from Pakistan to America and then killing it yeah. in America. Oh, thank that you. takes drive. Yeah. Yes. So it's a few things. One, very, very tough high school experience. Um, very, very not cool. You know, this is the thing I had sort of my whole life was like, I'm not cool. I'm not good looking. I'm not good at sports, but I'm smart. So I knew I was smart. So my all my drive. That's the name of my book. That whole thing. <laughs> I knew. I knew Kamal was smart. Is the name of my book. But anyway, <laughs> no, I was the Pipsqueak Diaries. Is really my book. But I, I, I hear what you're saying. So you were all these things, and were you picked on at all, or was that part of it, or was that all of it? What you're saying. So kind I of? switched high schools my last two years of schooling. So up until then, I was fine. I was always a nerd. I kind of got along with everybody. I wasn't popular by any means, but nobody picked on me. Mm -hmm. 
even the bad kids were like kind of cool to me. And then the last two years, I went to a new high school and suddenly I became uh, <laughs> the guy that was picked on. Oh, yuck. Because I think because I had a crush on a girl that like a cool guy had a crush on. Oops. And it sort Oops. of came out Oops. and it just became a nightmare. All I wanted to do was be invisible. <laughs> and all I was was completely picked on. They came, I had a friend of mine who was like, you know, when you first transfer to a new school, you're sort of like, oh, nobody oh, yeah. here knows that I'm Oh, it's ter terrifying. Who are you going to have lunch with? Yeah, but yeah. I was also like, oh, I can be cool at this school. Oh, they you got a new know. start. Oh, a fresh start. They don't got know. It. Exactly. They don't they know. They don't know. And so I went in. I sort of had developed a new cool walk. I was like, they're not going to know. Smart. <laughs> I was it contact. bouncy on the heels? Can you paint a picture what a cool walk is? Is it sort of strutting? Yeah, I don't care. Walking into every room, dick first, you know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah you, you know, I needed a PR person because when I, I would have hired one because I, <laughs> here's my thing, and I'll let you talk in a minute, but could I. You, could you afford five grand a month back, back in those days? God dang, it's worse <laughs> than that now. It's so sickening. Don't even let America know what we do. It's so gross and yeah, embarrassing. Keep that number. <laughs> keep it but to yourself. I, we'll get into money later because I want to know celebrity I know, you're, net you're worth. Rich. I, um, I look up people and I want to see what you got. Dana, I was What's, a little skateboarder in Arizona. <laughs> I was smart like this guy. Mm -hmm. And uh, and I was more pipsqueak, but I had white hair. I had some superpowers. We'll get to the Eternals in a minute. I had some superpowers because I had long, white, blonde hair, mm -hmm. not extensions. They were real. And mm -hmm. then I had- uh, Thick. Thick I had hair. cool shorts. I was tan back then. Obviously, that's gone away. But <laughs> and I had two broken arms when I got to school from skateboarding in empty pools. So I had I would had all this cool we stuff. Had a had double my cast way. on. We yeah, to double splints. My dad double splints. <laughs> my stepdad wouldn't give me a cast because he goes, "Let's let's wait and see." I go, "They're both broken. What are we waiting for?" He was a little. He was drunk. So he was a doctor also. So I um. I, I went to school when I was a nerd at my school. I was like a math guy and a spelling bee guy and a chess guy. And no one cared about me. I get to my high school and like he's saying, new PR campaign because my brother was cool. And all his cheerleader friends Ooh. liked me. And then the word spread like wildfire. Spade's cool. And everyone's in high school is like, oh, wait, no, he's not. No, he's not. It was too late. It was five schools merged and mine was a minority. They couldn't get the word out and it was getting stomped on. And then I was like, I'd walk by and go... Hey, old friends, um, how's math going in the flashcards, nerds? Anyway, new friends, let's go to the assembly. And so, so you I, transitioned to a cool group. That's, yeah. You pulled off something that's almost impossible. Almost. And, and believe me, everyone was baffled. Teachers, principals. Nobody, none of my friends had sex. Nobody. We were all, <laughs> we no, nobody. That. We're on the cross country team and the track team. Nobody uh, had sex. Yeah, nobody. most of nobody. mine still haven't. <laughs> All your and, friends. and they would be in their mid 40s it's like yeah. calling steve carell <laughs> you're like you're, you're on facebook with them going you guys i'm just lucky i'm an international star now or i'd be in your same boat yeah exactly all and you have to do yeah that's a one kind big of, jump you got to make got, kind of become kind of famous so you spade you must have been funny then already right well, it was back when uh, the great looks came later. Um, it went back when <laughs> you had to just mumble just jokes and just try to <laughs> sneak things in because no one's really listening and I don't really want to try to tell a joke mm. and I'm not really. So it was a lot of throwaways and things. And then it got, because you have to get some girl's attention. You have to get guys' attention. You, no one is rushing to hang out. And so that's just like what what a lot of us do. You just sort of, work on that part because you don't have the ease of just being good looking guy or girl where everything comes to you and you don't need to work on that at all. So, but, but then you started at some point as you became cooler, you were probably known as like the funny guy. At some point people started listening. At some I point we did talent shows and I would try old SNL sketches and try to write stuff with my buddies only to get it only because wow. was, I wasn't on football. I wasn't on track. I wasn't doing anything cool or fun and so we had two days you of a talent show you weren't on the football team i was not on any of the things <laughs> i was not i did try out and i got fucking smeared at there used to be an old term for that and uh and then 
the coach pulled me aside like Lucas, that old movie, and he said, I don't think this is for you, bud. <laughs> hey, man, I was on D basketball. You guys are too young for that. There was varsity, junior varsity, soft frosh, and then D. <laughs> and I'm not Wasn't kidding. Our, our center who controlled the paint was 5'3". Not a joke. <laughs> controlled the paint. <laughs> he controlled the paint at 5'3". Controlled the paint. Most of us were high. How high, high, how, how high was, the <laughs> was the basket? The basket was 10, and oh it was a God. Herculean oh, effort. That. To hit the rim. You guys didn't um, put on like a play school rim? Well, at home. Nerf. At home, we had a nine foot rim. And I'd practice in the driveway, thought I was really good, thought I was really cool. And then I get to the real thing, it's a foot higher. Shit. I was fucked, man. Um, what about your experience in high school, Camille? Yeah, Why, did you, we have to talk to him a little bit. A little bit. Let's, but I, I like hearing that, David. I, I'm yeah. sort of co hosting today. What was your experience? When did you go, I think I'm funny? Well, I want to hear yours, Dana. So all of high school, I was, I, I really do. All of high school, I was basically, uh, it, it was really bad. There was one, so when I first got there, I thought I could be cool. And my big mistake was right in the beginning, I started talking to some of the cool kids and they thought I was cool. And then at some point, very early on, week three, they figured out I wasn't cool. I don't know what happened. I think maybe- <laughs> What data did they get? Just something, just because you can't hide it forever. You can't hide it. And I think my previous two <laughs> was like an APB out or something, being like, hey, just so you know, this guy is just- pretending to be something he's not. <laughs> it's I like a Netflix a movie. Hey, you guys are triggering me a little bit. I just yeah. want to be honest about the fear I had in high school. And I'm getting a little triggered, just a little warning sign. But yeah, just this idea of being cool and do people like me? And you- yeah, and, and I got contact lenses, so I didn't have glasses. So I don't know how they found out, but they found out. So now the problem was they all know my name. <laughs> the next and problem. they know I'm very lame. Uh. One of my guy, one of my friends who was sort of a cool friend, he had become cool, you know, because he had become like hot over a summer. So he Ooh. was a nerd came back after a summer suddenly he was very handsome he got cool so wow he, I that's would very like rare help him with math homework and uh so he knew where i lived and then one day <laughs> he took all the other cool kids brought him over to my house and they threw eggs at my house wait yeah i what thought he's gonna come over a, and give you a party what no, a turncoat no oh my he god used, he used ben arnold to gain permanent membership into the cool crowd. Oh, that, you know, that would do it though. Yeah, it did. That, would, that like, really hey, helped know, him out. You know, wow. that, you know, that big nerd who's mm-hmm. uh, with the weird walk. I know where he lives. <laughs> I got his 20. I, I probably, <laughs> David did this. I don't know about you, but I would get an enforcer. His name was Steve Lee. And in fourth grade, I befriended him and he was my guard. And we had a club with one other kid and we call it the great club. And everyone wanted to be in the great club. And they say, how do we get in the great club? We've got to be great. It was only three of us. Great. But Steve Lee would beat up anyone who would attack me. That was my strategy. Because I was then I was 4'4", four, four, maybe 68 pounds. <laughs> how did you <laughs> manipulate Steve Lee? Uh, well, I don't know. Uh, funniness or whatever. I smoked. Uh, I stole cigarettes and smoked. I had fist fights. I shoplifted. I went through all that. But you were like actually cool. Um, you know what? Here, I'm going to ask you guys a question because I know our listeners are fascinated. You could have a cool f- fourth grade, mm. fifth grade, a little dormant, cool <laughs> dormant. in sixth, and then seventh and eighth, a little insecure. <laughs> and then yeah. in high school, it was all insecure because I'd never seen the cheerleaders were like gods. Marianne yeah. Silvestri was the most untouchable, oh, yeah. stunning uh, teenage girl. And so it was just nervousness at that point. <laughs> right, right. Suddenly we're like children. We look yeah. the worst we've ever looked in our lives. Yes, that's me. And the, 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 the horse that has kept our species alive for thousands of years is coursing through us. It's so unfair that yes. suddenly this biological need to procreate is given to us when we're like, when we look our worst and feel the worst about You're it. You're really putting it politely. It was like boner junction at my, I, I mean, I was in school and I could not, I couldn't, I couldn't focus on literally anything. I'm just no. like staring. Did, and I like, mean, like, this is like a stand up bit. Did you ever have a thing where the teacher would ask you to go up to the chalkboard? And you're already full throttle. You're like, <laughs> well, we didn't have mixed classes. We had boys and oh. girls classes. Oh, so not yeah. as many. 
So that was okay. But you can still mm-hmm. daydream, and then it's harder to explain. You're like, yeah. I was just thinking about girls, dudes. You know, chicks. <laughs> While you're you sweating. Can draw stick figure porn with your pencil. Not <laughs> what that if I you ever had did porn that. like today? What if you were on your phone under your desk and you're just looking at monster, you know, I can't mother, daughter, imagine. stepdaughter? Whatever would have, well, that would have been like. At it's too much. Age. Getting porn at that age was such a quest. You had to go on like mm-hmm. oh. side missions and stuff to be able to Worth get it. it, worth it. Yeah, Spiegel but catalog. my high school was, I was not, I did not think I was funny all through high school. It wasn't until I got to college in the U.S. that everybody was suddenly very nice to me and kind to me. And they were sort of interested in me because I was Pakistani and there were really no, there was one other Pakistani in the- You were like E.T. Everyone's what like, What was your hey, accent like you when you from? first came over compared to now? Was it, you? could you <laughs> talk, could, you could kind of, was it heavier or what? Or yes. did you always be bilingual? And, yeah. I mean, I always was bilingual, but I had a thicker accent, a thicker Pakistani accent. Um, mm-hmm. And so they were really interested. And s- suddenly I was funny. I don't know what happened, but I remember at one point talking to a friend of mine and them doing some riff about Aladdin's sword. I don't remember what it was, but her <laughs> laughing so hard she couldn't speak. And I was like, oh, wow, maybe this is what I have. And then people started calling me like, you know, you're I'm um, this of the group, I'm um, this of the group, and you're the funny one of the group. And Ooh, was, that's oh, interesting. You get a little moniker, so it kind of makes you believe it, right? Yeah. And suddenly I was like, oh, I have a personality. I'm a person. And my thing, my only thing is that I'm funny. And so that became the most important thing in the world was being funny was all I Because called. you know what, Dana, we're, I think I would say you two guys are, were pretty smart growing up. And it, it's not a panty dropper. Like when you're growing up, <laughs> funny... <laughs> That's because he was smart. Obviously, this dude's smart. And it wasn't really turning heads to be smart, especially probably people are smarter in Pakistan than over here. There so he comes always, over here. There was always someone smarter. And also, yeah. it wasn't social currency. Yeah. And then you get to dumb America. <laughs> and hey, even, but you even from, smart you here. You're from no. Pakistan. Yeah. You talk funny, don't yeah. you? <laughs> Did you think when you were over there, like, was anyone doing stand up? I mean, this has got to be beyond wildest dreams. Go to America, then be fa- be a stand up, and then be funny enough to do it, and then jump to millionaire, highest tax bracket. Go. <laughs> I, I won't. Or second I won't highest. Say that I'm, I'm where you guys are. Well, can um, I have an addendum question that's related to David? Yeah. So you're growing up at eight to eighteen. <laughs> you're you've got impressions of America. You're watching America on TV. And then you come to America and you do everything David just said. But I, what was the difference between your impressions of America and when you got here? Because you saw it through uh, television, right? Stuff like Television that. and movies, big fan of movies and TV. Really, you know, I was a very quiet, shy kid. So I spent most of my time watching movies, watching TV, playing video games. So my impression was of America was what you project to the rest of the world, which is for the mm. most part, New York and LA. When I moved yeah. to America, I moved to Iowa, which no, isn't that's even really funnier. Known. Okay, I, a whole different America. Yeah, when yeah. I landed, I was like, wait, where are all the buildings? What happened? <laughs> Why are there pigs everywhere? Um, so, so weird. Uh, Iowa's beautiful, by the way, but of all places. Beautiful. Now, looking back, I'm very happy I went to a place like Iowa where I was novel and mm-hmm. it wasn't so packed. It wasn't overwhelming. I I moved to a town of 9,000 people in the middle of Iowa. Right. Wow. That's a good middle step. It is. And so it helped me sort of, you know, acclimate to speaking English all the time and shaking hands with girls and all that kind of stuff. And just how to talk to girls. I didn't know how to talk to girls, not just even... You know, I don't mean romantically. I mean, just talking to a girl, sure. nerve wracking in the beginning. Mm-hmm. So so it was America was very, very different for me um, in Pakistan. To answer your question, Spade, um, the, there was not stand up the way we have it here. Now they do. India actually has a huge stand up scene in English. Um there were mostly people, there was one stand-up I really loved, and he did impressions, and he was very, very good. His name was Moin Akhtar. He has since passed away. Um, huh. But I follow he, him on Instagram. I would not I would not say 
I was a fan of comedy <laughs> or stand-up comedy until I got to college, and that's Sorry, but, really fell in love. Well, what what impressions would that gentleman do? That you just uh, yeah. a Pakistani impressionist? Would he do an American? No, or, it would no, be Pakistani just, celebrities. So those, oh, celebrities. Uh, okay. Yeah, like a Pakistani cricketer and stuff like that. Pakistani mm -hmm. cricketer, hilarious. How funny. Did Did you see that and think? The way I used to watch like Johnny Carson and see the comedians and you just go, it's so fun, but it seems too far fetched for you to do it, but it's just fun to watch. Right. Oh, it was impossible thinking that I could be in the biz. I, I mean, I honestly still kind of can't believe it because yeah. for me, it's been, a, you know, a million tiny little steps to it and your goals change as True. you get more opportunities. You know, there wasn't a point where I was like, Someday I want to be on a podcast with David Spade and Dana Carvey. You know, I couldn't have mm. I couldn't have imagined that. Mm. Um, and so, no, being being in this business was really, really not even a dream I dared to dream. I think gradual fame is a is a kind of a gift. It's your only chance of coming out somewhat sane. You guys both didn't have that. You guys became famous overnight. Uh... No, it took it took. I took me probably longer than Dana, but ten, ten, 10 years for me from my first set to getting on, get, getting on SNL, you know, but, being first show. For me, getting known has been tiny steps. You know, it, yeah. it wasn't. I didn't go from open mics to then suddenly doing something that everybody sees. Mm -hmm. I yes. had like small parts and things, slightly bigger mm -hmm. parts and things, slightly bigger parts and smaller things. So. My becoming known has been like a, a lot of tiny steps for you, Dana. I assume when you were doing stand up, you weren't really famous, and then suddenly you end up on SNL, and now yes. there's a day it's where a bigger you jump, become, yeah, become famous. Yes, pretty pretty quickly because I I you know it was a smaller cast and I had a couple good characters the first year, so yeah, it uh, a really bizarre thing that's happened to all of us when you first first time someone wants your autograph back then that wasn't pictures. Yeah. It's like, wow, you know who I am. And I stuff. miss those it's, days. Uh, yeah. I was at a mall with my mom recently and someone asked for a selfie and my mom laughed so hard she couldn't speak. She was like, why do they want your selfie? Why? I mean, oh. a picture of you two together. Uh, of and you? They lean like in. You, you're a star or what? It, what yeah. was she you? doesn't. It doesn't make any sense to her. So yeah, Dana, you and, and Spade, you had a similar thing, I assume, where you went yeah. from not being known to being very known overnight. Well, even when I got on SNL, it wasn't the Dana overnight success. Uh, Dana hit hard starting in the cold opening. Smaller I, uh, cast. Yeah, helped. smaller cast. Yeah. I got stand up and then I was sort of known around town in Arizona and Scottsdale. And that was a sort of fame, you know, that was right. a something. Of course. And that's probably what you did. And then... Uh, going and getting on like at the improv in LA that was I was in LA which counts as being famous in Arizona because someone actually broke out and said oh, I know I, I everyone decided. said I'm gonna it's like saying I'm gonna go to the US if you actually do do that you're already way ahead of the game if, yeah. if you're called for civilians outside LA and you're a comedy store regular or an improv regular you are kind of a celebrity back home yeah you know? I mean I moved from Chicago I was in Chicago and my comedian friends would move to LA in my head just by moving to LA they were famous exactly just just that <laughs> yeah. part Dana forget getting on they don't know that I'm eating yeah. you know I go to Ralph's and I try to buy one of those little rotisserie chickens and gnaw on it in the alley. They don't know <laughs> that it's like the walking dead, but I get two spots a week and I make $28 a spot or something and that's it. So I got to figure out a way to live. And then I got you were doing on the improv. Yeah. Then I get, then I do a little bit of road work. Then I got an HBO young comedian special. That was a big jump because it was on that's HBO. Cool. So can I ask you real, when you were doing these spots in LA at the improv, were you like crushing? No. No, I just, I look back and the lineups were like Leno, Paul Reiser, uh, Kevin Nealon, uh, were those Seinfeld. Already, were they, they already were already really, they were big headliners, yeah. but that's the lineup. I mean, I couldn't believe it. I go, these are the guys I've seen on Johnny Carson and they're all in one spot and they're going, everyone's doing 20. And they said, why don't you, they passed me. Comedy store said no, but improv passed me just because I was 20. I looked 15 and I had long blonde hair and they said, Looking back, they just didn't have one of me. You know, I didn't look like I'm from New York. I didn't look like I wasn't that tall. I just didn't look like a comedian. So they said, why don't you host or do a mm -hmm. set like at midnight? 
And that was it. And it's just to get out there and get warmed up and watch people. So gradual fame. Yeah. I mean, I want to get back to you, but I just got, then I got a movie. I had a small part and that was a big deal. What movie like, was well, that? Oh, it was a police Academy four, which was <laughs> as a, a skateboarding uh, guy, as a skateboarder. <laughs> yeah. And awesome. the reason, I, the reason I got awesome. that, I did not know how to act and I was blowing auditions. And then they said, I got there and they said, do you have the script? I said, Oh, they didn't send it. And they go, oh, shoot, they were supposed to. We don't have one here, uh, but you're already here. Um, should he go? And they go, well, do you just, if you were a skateboarder and you, and the cops are coming around, can you just say some stuff? Aren't you a comedian? <laughs> and I just start making up shit. And they go, yeah, let's use him. That's and if I would have had a script, I wouldn't know how to look at it. They would know right away. I don't know how to cold read. And I, I got lucky. Exactly that feeling. It's like a joy when they're like, there's no script. Can you just improvise? Thank you so much. Right. When that movie came out, did, was your scene funny in it? Not particularly, as my dad said. <laughs> but they, it was, I was in a movie, edited. you know? And the yeah. movie didn't even do that well, but it was, a, it was a chain of movies or whatever they call a series where the fourth one, and a franchise, I guess, back then. And it had been pretty watered down at that point. But Sharon Stone was in it. And she blew up after that. And so it was like a legit kind of movie. I just was just window dressing, did a few lines here and there and skateboarded. Tony Hawk was my stunt double. Um, but David, then, uh, you were like 23 or something. I was right? 21. And then, wait, 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 wait. Yeah. Tony Hawk was your stunt double? Yeah, another just super cool dude that I just, wow. I knew from Skateboard Magazines in Arizona. So all his Bones Brigade was my 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 little gang i ran around with so in the movie so i got to see them and then uh watch that now so like yeah. the most legendary skateboarder of all time the most iconic skateboarder yeah. of all time was your stunt double in your first movie right and, he, and you're we, 21 he <laughs> and he wasn't that big of a deal i mean we we're about the same age he he was probably a little younger uh, and chris miller another guy mike mcgill all the big skaters so but he was taller than me and he rode goofy foot no i rode goofy he rode the different way so we had two stunt doubles for me plus i could skate and so they would just intercut anyway boring but she's i was then, a bus boy at holiday inn at 21 but then i got on that <laughs> hbo thing and then marcy klein and everyone at snl saw that and then i got but i came on as a writer and i didn't really know I wasn't supposed to be a performer. So I was, as Lauren said the other day, Spade, I knew what we were doing with you. You were going to be on the bench for a while. Remember when he said that, Dana? I was like. Oh, he'd say, David's behind you. David's always ready. Uh, if anything <laughs> happens, he's always. Because he, David would sit behind me and read through at SNL. And he was always there. He's ready. He's with ready my Dana to, voodoo He's doll. ready to go whenever. <laughs> you, if you falter. Um, he'll like take your place. Meanwhile, right? I didn't know, say that. Not I know, but Dana's like a super <laughs> comedian with impressions and plays every big person. And he's looking at me like, this guy doesn't scare me. I'm just like mumbling jokes. You're so always funny. But it worked back, out. Back to but, our guest. Yeah, let's go back to him for a little bit. <laughs> and then so I'll, we'll come back to you. <laughs> Honestly, I think that your lives are much more interesting than my lives. I, no. I, 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 no. I have, so, so sorry, sorry, Spade. So, I want to, how did you get the, I'm curious, unless you guys have already talked about this on the podcast. No, it's boring. If you haven't talked about it, then I want to ask you, how did you get the, so you got to, you got, you got to do like five minutes on one of the young comedian specials. Yeah. With other how, people. And who, and how did you get that? And who was on it with you? Cause those are crazy lineups. Rob Schneider was on it with me. Um, mm -hmm. We got, we got plucked to audition off of that. You need some heat like that. We had management that had SNL people. We had, so you, well, I'm in the vicinity of it. They had Dana. I lived um, with Dana. I lived in his in insert a house. Insert here, Dennis Miller and I were just kind of fledgling on SNL. We, there, I had done stand-up with Rob Schneider for years. He was my opener. And then when I met David, went before I got on SNL. So they were in the ether and they came yeah. in like freaking frack. It was yeah. Rob Schneider, David Spade. They always were just a notch funnier than their peers at the time. And so they matriculated to SNL. Dennis and I recommended them and then they auditioned mm. well and they ended up being legends. Those two were a big help. And then, um, then I got on, but it took me a while to get on, which got me back to the fame thing. It was exciting, but it was infuriating and frustrating. But then it then came do, mo movies and stuff. Stand up? Yeah. Um, Didn't, did not do that well. Uh, <laughs> but like, like I was watching your monologue on SNL, which uh, 
listen, and that was a tough crowd. No, I'm kidding. You did great. But uh, yeah. <laughs> I know you've gotten so much praise for it. I had to stop for they one second. Weird. That's your, that's no, your- that wasn't even your fault. I was jealous of it. I watched it today. <laughs> yeah. I, I've hosted three times. I never had a monologue like that. Yeah, you that fucking rocked that. That was that well formed. What are you that, saying? What are your negatives you, know. you get from people when they try to fake compliment you? Well, for me, it was with, with stand up. You know, if you don't do well, you always say, like, they were weird. That's <laughs> so great. Right when you get off. <laughs> yeah. You think you kill and you go, fuck them. You go, yeah, they were, or the they audience. say to you, how did you think it went? That's yeah. a tell. <laughs> How did you how did you feel about it? I always could tell if I had a good set or a bad set. If people said that was good, that was a bad set. If they said that was funny, that was a good set. Ah, I love it. And if they switch their compliment. A compliment also, Dana, is when you say, uh, if you don't like their act, but they do good, you go, you yeah. killed. You don't um, say anything. That's a, that's a polite way of saying... Your hacky garbage. I hate is when they, 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 and I've said this before, when they switch out their compliment at the last second, like they're starting to say great and they switch to good. Oh, that was <laughs> great, good. Fuck. Good. Just go good. Don't the switch. The math in their head is if I say great, he's going to know I'm lying. If I say good, maybe he'll buy it. Well, can I ask you a question? Well, how did you deal? So you, you come to America, you go to college, you're going to try. How did you deal with the early bombs that we all have? How well, resilient was- were you? Or I'll did you was, ever bomb? <laughs> I was very lucky in that the first time I did stand up was on campus my senior year. I did a set my first semester uh, of the, my final year and then the second semester. And the first set I ever did in my life, I did 25 minutes. I had no idea that that's wow. not what you do. That's crazy. So you I that long? Writing for a few months and I tried all these jokes for 25 minutes in this coffee shop. And it was probably like a hundred people crammed into a tiny room. And it was a bunch of my friends. And I, to this day, one of the best sets I've ever had. Um, that's, that's what Dane always says. Dana says your first set sometimes is your best. Usually really the very one. first, cause you, it, you psychologically have a free pass. It's like when the quarterback gets hurt and the other guy comes in, well, there's no pressure on me. I hope I do. Okay. So the first set, like, did they announce you as that's my, it's his first time doing stand up. Everybody, it was everybody's first time, except oh, the okay. guy who had done it before. So it was all college kids, just a thing on campus. We all did 20, 25 minutes. That's um, too much. So, <laughs> That's too much. Dude, I wish I had a VHS of that. I have a picture from it. I'm wearing this huge sweater. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Comedy sweater. We all have Hilarious them. sweater. You got to have a funny sweater. I really, really <laughs> genuinely, objectively crushed. Like I really sort of became right after that kind of a little bit famous on campus. They were like, wow, hey, you're that guy. You, yeah, you, that, that means so much. Suddenly. And then I did it again the second semester. And now people were like excited to see me. A bunch of other people had also performed on it, but they were like, oh, Kamel's going to go up again. And then the second time I, I killed again, not as hard as the first time, but still very, very good. And so after that, Suddenly, a little bit on campus, I was like one of the guys that that people knew. And then I moved to Chicago and I just looked up in the reader, which was a local newspaper, just open mics. And I was very lucky, um, Dana, in that I did not have a bomb until maybe my 25th or 30th set. I didn't okay. bomb for quite a long time, the first few mm-hmm. months. How was that? How did it feel? It felt, it felt kind of great. I think I would have needed that confidence <laughs> because I had no, I had, I was so insecure at that time that if I had bombed the first time, I would have never done stand up again. And if I bombed the fifth time, maybe I never would have done stand up again, which is what's always impressive to me. You know, when you start doing open mics and you meet comedians and you hang out and they've been doing it for a couple of years, and I'm like, you have never once done well. <laughs> <laughs> I am so impressed that you I know that, it. that's a nasty yeah you they just never once like they, you're, you're not even funny at all <laughs> no you're not funny your inner fortitude is so fucking impressive to me you it's should true. be like a soldier what are you doing you should be oh, also army. your bits aren't working <laughs> no and you keep doing the bits yeah it's like you gotta call the herd. they're like there's something there and you want to shake and go there's nothing there there's, there's nothing. nothing there but you know sometimes there are people that you see there's nothing there and you they're like those comedians that other comedians make fun of that's what happened with hannibal burris you guys know hannibal oh mm-hmm. yeah he got funny overnight he was not funny 
he was one of the guys that people were we would be like fucking Hannibal here again. And I remember a friend of mine called me and was like, "Have you seen Hannibal recently?" And I was like, "No." And they're like, He's "Funny now." I was like, "What do you mean, Hannibal? Hannibal Burris is funny." He cracked yeah. the code. He figured it out. I mean, maybe that's what it takes. He didn't like slowly get funny. He was not funny. And <laughs> funny. Jesus, uh, like a twilight so great. zone. That's so great. And the first right, time now, I, I would say I bombed, I did a guest set at Zanies. You guys know Zanies in Chicago? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, I was, uh, it was me, John Roy, who's a very funny comedian also from Chicago. I don't know if you guys know him. And then I forget who the headliner was. Um, but that was my first time I didn't do well. And it really felt, it was an awful feeling because I didn't understand what happened. I was like, these are the same jokes. These jokes do well. And that set, I had like a 10 minute set. And I was like, I'm going to start strong and strong. And then you have the bits in the middle that are not quite as strong. Well, my first joke didn't do that well. So then I pulled my closer up, which oh, no. didn't do well. So now I'm out there. I got six minutes still left and all my B jokes. And that's it. Yeah. That's so funny when you scramble like that and you get spooked like a horse and you start going, what is going on here? And you jump ahead and mixing up your jokes. And then you go, wait, did I even do this one? Because now it's out of order. Chris Rock used to go, Spade, tonight, just to <laughs> shake it up, open with your closer. I go, shut the fuck up. I'm not opening with my That's closer. That's a Louis C.K. trick. You know, it's you play so around with and it. Then he goes, try to bomb. Yeah. And then he goes, yeah. then, where are you? What are you going to do? Where are you headed? I go, Fuck, don't scare me, dude. I've been doing this too long. I don't do that shit. This yeah, is too I don't risky. Be, I don't want to put myself in a position like that. Why would I do that? <laughs> I, I want to just, what I do is I pack it with jokes at work and then put one new one in the middle and then fucking baby it after that with stuff. Hopefully they'll get me out of that hole if it doesn't work. Exactly. I mean, that's how I would always like, the way I planned my set was always, I really put a lot of thought into it. Some people don't do that. Some people just go up and like, I'll do whatever I feel like doing. Later, once I got, I would say, um, really experienced with stand-up and started feeling really confident, when I moved to New York, I really, there were a couple of years in New York where I was like, I was really feeling at the top of my game. Then the challenge to myself was, how long can I be up there without doing a joke at all? So that was the challenge every Ooh, day. Just off the top of your head, was it crowd work or just you're making up stuff? Making up stuff, sometimes crowd work, whatever it was. I was like, the goal is to go up there. And when I step on stage, have no idea what the first words are to my Wow, mind. it is terrifying. I liked it. That's my favorite. I've done it, but it's, I, I will go, or I'll have a, like two new things and go, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to open with these two, get a feel for the crowd and then just go into my act. But I just am so sick of my act. I will have to start with a couple of new bits. And sometimes you stumble into a winner. Well, for me, the good thing was if I'm doing well, just riffing, I'm like, mm. wait till they get a load of the shit I've been writing. <laughs> yeah. You know, yeah. and if it's not going well, no problem. I haven't done any of my jokes yet. For me, I yeah. think the fear was what if I do my first joke and it doesn't do well? Where do I go? So that for me was what made me comfortable and safe on stage was not doing any jokes for the for as long mm-hmm. as I could go without doing any jokes. Yeah. I still don't have any jokes. I, I can't write a joke. I mean, I just, I have like three jokes. I love them, but I just can't come up with jokes. Like well, jokes. It's all not, rhythm and all attitude. <laughs> it's, but you're true. such a funny I, person. You do jokes and then you impress, with your, your, every impression you have is, is, woven in with jokes so it's a combo hit it's like it sounds like somebody and you're saying something funny man mega tour mega t that's a joke oh okay oh you saw (laughs) that jeez i'm gonna cry of course i did that was a pretty good that's a pretty good bit about the frustration of parenting uh in that style of parenting with a it was like as if a kid a little kid's like a hundred year old man you have to take care of or something like that yeah, you better buy like, me a toy or I'm going to be sad. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, and how like the resell action figures with just a little bit slight change. The name slightly of different else. crook. And he's saying that's not the right doll. It has a slightly <laughs> different figure. We're halfway through. Um, and I want to say that Emily and I rewatched that uh not too long ago because she's such a huge fan of that that ah, i love her <laughs> <laughs> she you know i met a comedy nerd that we, we that's how we fell in love she like used to record snl 
she didn't have a VCR, so she would record it on an audio tape and she would just listen to the audio of SNL sketches. Like, wow, which kid. is she a hundred? No, how old is she? <laughs> when, did, when did you get together? Uh, 2007 or when did you? 2006, that's right. Okay, so basically you have a pre-fame, pre-money for you wife. Yes, and when we first moved to New York, <laughs> just, I mean, nice. she did meet at a comedy show and I was like, you know, Chicago famous at the time, which really yeah. famous. But I was good enough on stage. I was like killing on stage enough that, you know, if I did a show, she was at the show, I was feeling pretty good about my chances. Um, but mm, no right. money lived like, you know, I had a mattress on the floor. It was. And then when we moved, David, to New York, solid gold mattress, <laughs> David, <laughs> David had a lot of mattresses. <laughs> what does that mean? <laughs> well, before you made it, remember the story in New York, you just bring oh, the mattress would, back to L.A. When, would, I, you, yeah. when I lived in New York, Lauren wouldn't pick us up in the summer and he would make us wait. And so you'd have to literally get out of your whole apartment and move back to L.A. And then a month later. They go, hey, we can't get a hold of me as an Amagansett. We, we will, he'll decide in another month. I'm like, he would they don't have break. any phones. No one can find him. Yeah. So when I, if I got picked up. The, You'd have to move it back. I'd have to move all again. And there wasn't <laughs> Uber or delivery. So I'd drag a mattress up some stairs. <laughs> I felt so confident I had an interior decorator after the first season. God like, damn you I, asshole. I'm going to be here for a while. No, I'm kidding. Well, dude, so, you're, Dana, you're, you were like a hit right from the beginning, right? Yeah. Well, the church lady was on the first show. Wow. Uh, was... I can't imagine that. You, you're you like suddenly one day you're just a person and the next day yeah. you're like famous in the country. I Before I went out I'm there because I, I'd never done sketch comedy, I was so nervous. <laughs> never that done I, sketch <laughs> comedy. Look at this guy. <laughs> I'd never done sketch comedy, but I, I was a sketch comedy person by heart, but doing stand-up. So I did yeah. church lady as part of my stand-up. But I was so fucking nervous the first show that I was just swearing at myself in the mirror. Fuck, fuck, you know. And then afterwards, I was so emotional how well it went that I was just basically tearing up quite a bit. Can I in ask my dress you? <laughs> you're it was nervous, a big ride. Obviously. You're obviously very nervous. You're doing this thing. Um, and you go to dress and it, mm -hmm. and, and it, it kills a dress. Church Lady was the final sketch at Dress. As you know, that's the graveyard spot. Like, this right. isn't probably going to work. It's a two-hour dress. It's then it burned kills, out. and it's moved up to the first sketch and so for the air kills, show. I yeah. wanna, I just, I'm sorry. I just want to know every step of how you're, like, negotiating this. You go out. Are you nervous at Dress? You're very nervous at Dress. This is going to get... Oh, yeah. Yes. And at what point do you get your first laugh and you feel like, okay... Wow, this is something. Or do you not feel that relief? No, at the end of there this? was an exact moment because I'm out there with Victoria Jackson. I'm very scared and I'm doing the interrogating thing. And, well, we don't do that. Well, church lady, I did this and we didn't do that. And she goes, yeah, but I did this. And then I said, well, isn't that special? Huge laugh. Wow. So already. Wow. Before, before they even knew it. It's a catchphrase it. already. But yeah. until I landed that, I did. I was just wanting to articulate just please don't blow it you know and then once i landed that i connected to the ten thousand hours in the clubs it was like oh i'm off the races did you know when you bef did you know this is the big line i gotta land or were you surprised that the at the reaction it got i had done it in the clubs and it, it would evolve from an improv it's the ultimate patronizing put down when someone's being sincere Yes. And it did become a catchphrase. I had it in the clubs and the church lady would work in the clubs. It was me interviewing myself or dealing with hecklers. We don't quite know what to say, do we? You know, that thing. <laughs> I knew that attitude worked, uh, but I'd never done it with the dress and never done it. So it was out of body. I, I, I don't know if you've had experiences like that, maybe getting nominated for an Academy Award for the screenplay or getting cast on Silicon Valley. Let's let's go back to when you were yeah. shocked and amazed at your success. Was there any moment or was it just gradual? When did you start getting recognized? It, was national? Silicon Valley your first national like thing that people knew you from? No. The first thing I would say that uh, I did a sketch on Portlandia, season one of Portlandia. Love that uh, show. Fred yeah. Armisen. Fred yeah. Armisen, Carrie Brownstein, very, very funny Great. people. Yeah. And um, the first thing I'd ever done on TV actually uh, was I had two lines on SNL. 
I read that. Yes. Do tell. They needed a brown guy, and I was doing. <laughs> no, sorry, they did. I mean, they casting still do, breakdown. You know? They still do. <laughs> they still do. Um, they got plenty of this flavor. <laughs> <laughs> um, they. I was doing well in New York, and one of the writers for SNL emailed me and was like, "Hey, we need someone to just come in and do three lines for this sketch." And I said, "Yes, of course." Fuck yeah. Under five, so I like hang out with the extras all day. You know, we hang out in the theater that Conan was taping in at the time. Um, and I have three lines and a dress. Um, it's uh, it's an episode with James Franco, and it's James Franco and Sudeikis are at the, you know, they're like at the dais, and we're a bunch of reporters asking questions. It's a press conference. And Sudeikis messed up his line. Oh and no! It threw me so much in dress that I messed up my line. I just didn't know. I just literally just stumbled my words. So then suddenly, when I get the script for the um, oh, no. for air, <laughs> now I have two lines instead of uh, lines. Uh, and I remember it was really cool. Uh, we're starting the sketch. I haven't. I don't know Sudeikis at all. He's there while we're about to do the live one, and he looks at me and he says, "I'm sorry." He like apologized to me. Oh, that's cool. That meant a lot to me. I remember Will Forte was like really, really cool to me. He he understood this guy has never been on TV. He's got live, he's got two lines live. So he went out of his way to like be kind to me. And I've told him that and he doesn't remember it. I was like, that's great. Sounds but exactly like him. Yeah, cool. Carol dude. Hammond was very nice to me. Very so sweet. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, did By the way, it's hard to do that when you're in the in the heat of a show and mm -hmm. you're a cast member to think enough to go out of the way because you're so in your own head, terrified yourself, you know? Yeah. And I yeah. remember Kristen Wiig, when we were rehearsing, laughed really hard at me and said mm -hmm. that was really funny. So I, I feel like maybe they could tell, oh, this is another performer. This is a very big deal for him. Let, mm -hmm. I was just touched that they all went out of their way to make me feel confident and comfortable and welcome. I like this story. He's like, then Lauren that's came out nice. and they sang for he's the jolly good fellow and they carried me around. Yeah, yeah, that's right. <laughs> um, and then Lauren, for some reason, blacklisted me from Hollywood. <laughs> <laughs> so, you, um, so basically, like, why don't we jump to that? Because you go through Silicon Valley. Which no, is but, a but, but the thing that people really knew me from was Portlandia. I did a yeah. sketch with them. So that was your first thing yeah that was my first thing and that was an improvised sketch we improvised for like two hours and they cut it down john Kreisel, the director into a, a four minute sketch three minute sketch and it came out really funny um fred's really funny carrie's really funny mm -hmm. and it just came out really funny and that show the first season was kind of like a cool hit yeah yeah um, and oh, yeah. that Every job I've had since then to this day comes from that one sketch. Ooh, oh, nice. Wow. And so every little thing, every audition, everything comes from that. So then with Silicon Valley, and then I was another show on TNT called Franklin and Bash with Breckenmeyer and Mark Paul. Hilarious Paul. reference. <laughs> Franklin and Bash. <laughs> but I'm on I the love, show. <laughs> I, I love the name. Still, I know, but Dennis Miller used to go, when are you on fucking Franklin and Bash this week? <laughs> What's well, yeah. a great, great <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Turner and Hooch, huh? Oh, yeah, it's like a Turner and Hooch type yeah, of just, show. It's just a funny but that Iowa. was like a that was like a yeah, Rizzoli. <laughs> that's <laughs> that's that that beats it. The Rizzoli yeah, and Isles yeah, is yeah. fucking we were hilarious. On the same time as Rizzoli and Isles, <laughs> much worse numbers. This is all true. <laughs> this is all true. Um, mm. so I was on that show for like two years, and it was you know it was funny. It was a fun show. I had a fun part, but I was like, I got to be on a comedy. I didn't have a job. So I went to the creators and I was like, guys, can you like write me out of this show? They're like, did you get another job? I said, no, I just wow. need to bet on myself. And I really want to mm. be on a show that's a comedy. They said, this is a comedy. And you go, oh, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> it was a, it was a comedy. I just was like, I want to be on a sitcom, guys. I want to be on a sitcom. So they said, OK, do one more season for us. But in the meantime, you can go audition, do whatever you want. We'll That's nice. Productive. We'll just do one more season for us. That's cool. Out of the contract. And, and I said, thank you. And the first audition I did after season two was Silicon Valley. Okay. Okay. And there we I, go. Have, I get a call from my agents. They're like, Mike Judge has a new show. And, you know, I grew up on Beavis and Butthead. I, 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 office space is a. Loved it. Yeah. Loom's Mike Judge, a quiet genius. Quiet, he, quiet. He's brilliant. Genius. Yeah. Yeah. 
And so I go and I audition for Mike and they give me two different characters to audition for. So I'm just excited. I'm just excited to meet Mike. You know, he's, he's mm-hmm. a truly mm-hmm. genuinely a hero of mine. Beavis and Butthead. I don't mean this in a, I, I truly mean this. It I, no, me I love, love those characters. I told him they're much funnier than Wayne and Garth. I don't know if you believe me, but By the I way, love Beavis and Butthead. There's a new season on Paramount Plus, Beavis and Butthead. That's yes. Just as good as the original stuff. Mm-hmm. So I go in and audition for Mike and I do these two parts and, um, <laughs> I had a good audition, you know, I could tell they were laughing and stuff. I was like, okay, Mm -hmm. that was a, that was, I feel good about that audition. I get a call from one of the other creators, not Mike. They say, we really like you. We don't think you're right for either of the parts. And I'm like, fuck, but we're going to write a part for you. Oh, and I said, sweet. I said, thank you. But people say that all the time. You know, they're like, Mm -hmm. you're not right for this. We'll find something Mm -hmm. and it never happens. And then um, they're like, okay, we want you to come and do the network test for it. Um, and I was out of town. Uh, I couldn't do it. I was, I was uh, doing a pilot that never went that I also, that I didn't like doing. So I couldn't test. I was like, fuck, it's over. Luckily I'd done a part. Sorry, this is all confusing. I'd done one scene. I'd done one episode of Veep season two that I'd auditioned for mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. with Julia Louis-Dreyfus. And uh, that that part turned out funny. I ended up having like one funny moment in that episode. So HBO knew me. And so I flew back from Miami. I was like, fuck, I couldn't test. Uh, That's too bad. I landed and I got a call. Um, And you know, when you get those calls where like all your agents and managers are on the phone. Yeah, (laughs) it's usually good. Yeah, Yeah, usually good. They're all calling me. And Remember us <laughs> since the signing meeting, you know, yeah, they're all on it. I land and I have a voicemail. They're like, Hey, this is, you know, John, Mel, Molly, Jimmy, Michael, everybody. everybody's there. <laughs> I the call 10 back, percenters. And yeah. they're like, you have an offer <laughs> to be on Silicon Valley. You got I'm an like, offer with no audition. I just did the one audition. I didn't. Yeah. Yeah. But didn't get the, part. The, the, the studio and the network. Right. I didn't have to do that because they're so, so lucky. Wow. And just we we did the pilot and I just the entire time was pinching myself because I got to work with all these funny people with Mike Judge. You know, we did the pilot and we didn't find out for a long time, like six or seven months if the show was going to get picked up. Um, And then Mm -hmm. it, it got picked up and we ended up reshooting most of the pilot. Um, and they the style of Portlandia and and that you know it's you, I mean you you have a very how would you describe your acting style because it's very it's it's subtle yeah, and just it's describe it it's and I'll very tell you natural. If you're wrong. David wanted to know. I said <laughs> let's let him describe it. Okay. Well, I, I can't describe it, but I will say John Altshuler, who is one of the creators of Silicon Valley, gave me the biggest compliment I think I've ever received. He said. And this is going to sound bad, but I, I, it's it's a compliment. He said, you know, you can do a joke and make it not sound like you're doing a joke. And I was yes. like, it's hard wow. to do. Yeah. I, I was like, that is a really wonderful thing to hear, because especially with stand ups, you know, sometimes you see them acting and you can see they're trying to nail a joke. Um, and to me, the key is you got to hide. It's a joke. You got to get the laugh. You have to get the right. laugh. Right. Mm-hmm. But it can't sound like you're like delivering a punchline. But if it's the tone, like you're on shows that are interesting, Veep that and your show are great very for, away, for my sense of humor, for probably yours, Dana. And if you're on a sitcom, you might have to blast it out a little bit. And that's tougher because it might not be your style or what you like at all. But there are different tones of different comedies. But that kind of comedy is obviously my favorite. And uh, but, but just you're, even, you're, you're also very good at it. And when you were on Just Shoot Me, you know, you did a really good job um, of bringing that character to yourself. So it really felt like you were yourself the entire time. And the way you were doing jokes was the way you do jokes. It didn't feel like you were like performing outside of um, right. uh, outside of something that felt very natural to you. Right. Like a super yeah. character. Yeah, it was more meeting with them ahead of time and talking, this is kind of what I do and this is kind of what they want. And then tailoring it, letting you add jokes on the last take or say, do whatever you want here. 
or uh, sometimes they would just say, and then Spade says something funny. <laughs> <laughs> That's so you go awesome. to rehearsal. Yeah, they were great about it. Um, and it, it, you know, what's funny is is what you said at the very beginning about Dane as a nice guy. George Siegel used to say the biggest question I get is is David Spade's as big of a prick as he seems like? Because <laughs> <laughs> you were playing a snarky character. I was, and I was. I, I you know, I've tried to even tone down even that kind of. I, I thought it was subtle then. I think it's got to be subtler now because I did. You know. You're, you're going for laughs and it is a sitcom and you have a studio audience, but you have to inch it up a little bit. But I did like that kind of humor and I, and all the shows I gravitate just watching your monologue, even on SNL. And then you were doing the sketches. They were, they were playing you. Uh, mm -hmm. They did you justice because you, you are doing a lot super, of stuff. That's super throwaway. chill, super conversational. And yeah. then, and then, and then a, the subversion comes or the twist and it's so in rhythm with what you were just saying, you know, it's very, very effective and not easy to do. You guys could do a sitcom. Yeah. I would love to do a sitcom with, with you guys. Either or yeah. Either this, this next couple months are really tough for me, though, right now. Okay. So I'm sorry. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, me too. Me too. <laughs> by, the way, by the way, listen, we we'll look at Dana. Here's what he said in Vanity Fair, which I thought was an interesting quote. You said, um, our guest. And, by, and yes. by the way, no, we will be doing a sitcom. I was kidding. Um, you said, I like, uh, I like, oh, you being a comedian makes you a better actor. Being an actor makes you a better writer. And then you're a better comedian than you were. And then you're being a producer, director, all that stuff. It all is very entwined. I think that's what you meant. It's great. I think that's, it is really true. And it's good. You've got your hands in different things and you see different things. And then you go, oh, I'm on that side. Oh, I'm on this, you know. Yeah. I remember, you know shooting a sketch that I wrote on SNL. I, I, I wrote on SNL. Oh, you wrote? Wow. One week. I had, and then they they asked me to finish out the season and I realized I was like, sketch is not my strength. I don't, my brain doesn't work like this. And it's I'm a different talking. animal for sure, yeah. Yeah, and my brain has never worked like that. I still can't, I still can't write sketch, you know? And it used to like, I used to be like, you know, I have friends like Nick Kroll. I'm like, wow, this guy can yeah. really do sketch. And it would mm. bug me that I couldn't do it. And now I, I'm like, you know what? I have my strengths. They don't include sketch. So I wrote that for one week and we, you know, uh, being part of shooting a sketch and editing the sketch was very, I understood like, okay, you can do certain riffs. It was a taped sketch, pre-taped. Mm -hmm you could do certain riffs that are going to make the crew laugh and the cameraman laugh and everyone's going to laugh, but those riffs are never going to make it into the show. And so doing the editing um, and being involved with the editing and a lot of the projects we've done makes me realize like, okay, improvising is good. However, if you're just going off the reservation, um, it's never going to be used. It's just going to make those people laugh. And ultimately it's kind of a waste of time. Um, and that's something I learned on the Silicon Valley, too. I remember we were doing the scene that was really, really funny. We were all riffing and Alec Berg, one of the showrunners, came up to me, us and said, listen, all of this is really funny. We're having a great time. However, this scene is about these three things. This person finds out this information mm -hmm. and goes from here to here. The audience hears this. You can riff, but if they don't advance one of those three things, it's not going to be in the show. Yeah. And to me, that like really connected everything. I was like, oh, wow. It's not just about being funny. We're just being funny here. Yeah. And it's not helping. It's about yeah. furthering the point of the scene while being funny. Um, and so mm -hmm. all that, I think everything makes you better at everything else. And that's how you ended up writing The Big Sick and getting an Academy Award nomination. So you took all that experience yeah. and then your real life experience for people who don't know, you wrote this incredibly successful, I don't know what you would call it, genre is, a romantic comedy, basically. Um, uh, yeah, Emily With and drama, I, yeah, yeah your we wife. Yeah, we wrote this movie together, but I will say that Judd Apatow and Barry Mendel, one of the other producers, Ugh. really, Judd <laughs> really taught us how to write. He really carried us through that entire process. And, You're doing it all wrong. Here, come here. Hi, love yeah. me. Hi, all. I'm Judd Apatow. Your laptop. I don't know if this sounds like Judd Apatow, but I'm huh. just, this is a call. this is a substitute impression. No, you've ah. actually you've done pretty well. I just got to punch up a couple of things. That doesn't sound like Judd Apatow. <laughs> None of this does. <laughs> just sounds funny though. <laughs> it sounds like it sounds like a funny character. Hi, Spade. 
That's why I, um, I do 10 minutes of this, the improv. Both time. of you have certain different aspects of Judd in there. <laughs> If you could combine them, I think you'd get uh, No, we've had Judd on this show, yeah, and uh, he is very, very, very smart, very clever about about writing, about what makes it He knows it what he's doing. And producing. You know, he's the guy you want to call if you want to get something made, you know? I, I you saw your trailer. I, I have to say, I did not see the movie, and I'll take that part out later, but I did not see the movie. You're making but me sick. When I watched the trailer, it's such a great trailer, because first of all, I got teared up. Second of all... Ray Romano, who I work with a lot, is su- is great. Just in the trailer, your first joke is funny. You're with the girl in bed. Um, you know, she says, I I never have sex twice on the first date. Yeah. Is that her joke? Yeah. And that was oh, funny. Yeah. So it's off right away with a the, with the winner. By the time Ray comes in and Holly Hunter, you have no skills. That's some broadcasters. <laughs> yeah, she, uh, her, yeah. Yeah, you have no schooling. Yeah. yeah, she, so she... And Ray and Ray's doing these dry things to you, and it's awkward. I I just thought, oh shit, that's a uh, very well done. And then that big twist of what happens to the girl you're seeing. I, anyway, it's it's very uh, well done. I my first movie would not be anything that good. I well, mean, that's we, to write that shit. Well done because we had Judd really carrying us through, and because of Judd, we were able to get you know a really good cast. So like Holly Hunter. Well, Zoe Kazan, who plays Emily, you know, mm-hmm. uh, in the movie was the first person we cast and we auditioned a lot of people and uh, a lot of great people. Um, and and a lot of like people who are very, very famous and were very, very famous then. Um, and out of everyone, Zoe was just the best. And once mm-hmm. we had that, Judd was like, OK, now we now we know who the who she is. Now we know what her parents can be like. Mm-hmm. And he was like, you know, I think it should be Holly Hunter. And we were like, good luck. And he was wow, like, Wow, yeah. I think she'll do it. So we had a lot of conversations with Holly. And once we had Holly, Judd was like, that's when Judd sprung Ray Romano. He was like, it's got, I think Ray would be really good. And I was a huge fan of his sitcom and his stand up. And I just never seen him do anything that wasn't hard comedy, you know. But Ray really brought what Ray has inherently in everything he does is this like, sadness at his core like he's sort of a yeah. sad sack kind of <laughs> <laughs> he's a sensitive guy yeah he's a definitely. sensitive guy that's what yeah. i mean he's a, a, yeah. sort of sensitive there's something mm-hmm. like appealingly wounded about him um and he was he's so so good in this movie you know david if you you know if you if you find yourself when you watch the movie you'll see Ray and Holly really bring so much to it. Holly, it's not, you know, Holly's done so much fantastic work in acting. With Ray, the dramatic work he does in the movie, it's so Yeah, it's stuff. more surprising because it, it's just, uh, I work with Ray and I know a lot of stuff he does. And and he, every, there, the, nothing was wrong. Everything was real. Everything was good. Just I'm just saying the trailer and I'm like, fuck, this movie's so interesting. So, uh, and you- pepper it out so it's you're you're hooked already and 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 uh holly well, Hunter, like, of course like you can't go wrong successful movie you you had a sensibility and it you, you never winked you never stepped outside yeah. of it. you never were gratuitous that's the uh, key and you, you just stayed in that world yeah yeah because you know if there's a woman there's a lot of funny jokes you can make but if there's a woman in a coma there's a ceiling to the type of jokes you can make, you know, Mm -hmm. you can't go because then that kills a reality level. The entire time you have to feel like all these people have a loved one who's very, very sick right now. Yeah. Yes. They can make certain kinds of jokes, but if they go past a certain line, it's heartless and it kills the whole movie. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Did Judd make you change the name from coma lady? Yeah, that was the working title with (laughs) coma lady. Um, and then Sounds like, hilarious. Maybe it's too much of a spoiler. <laughs> uh, don't want to do that. <laughs> so we did that, and that happened. You know, uh, I've been doing. I think that was season three of Silicon Valley. In between seasons three and four, I did that, and that was cool because Silicon Valley was a very successful show. Um, but then Big Sick was getting to do another kind of thing. Next level. I oh, think yeah. that's when your name just became just way more familiar to a lot of Americans when those two things and came together. I think yeah. did you feel like it to you? Like I yes. you've arrived. I mean 
you know well, the weird thing I, i'm sure you guys have had this experience you know you you fight for for me it was years of fighting for roles tiny roles you know i had the two years where i had a small one funny scene in a big comedy i did that for a couple of years you know so there's like mm-hmm. six or seven movies you watch them i pop up for a scene i deliver food i'm funny for two minutes and then i walk away <laughs> um, big sick changed the kinds of opportunities i guess sure overnight suddenly i became mm-hmm. one of the people who could I became one of the new comedy actors, you know? So suddenly I'm, I, that's soon as the big sick comes out, I start getting scripts. I start yeah. getting more opportunities. People say that, but it's really hard to get to a point where you actually get scripts and get scripts that are like green lit. Like if you do it, we'll do it. Yeah. I mean, that, that's a whole other thing that, you know, this new show that I have coming out, welcome to Chippendales. Um, uh, on Hulu, November 22nd. It's mm-hmm. the first time I've had a real situation. You know, getting Big Sick made was a struggle. We had to really put a cast together and sure. and all that. And it was only $5 million. Welcome to Chippendales was the first time I've had in my career where they were like, if you do this, if you join, if you attach yourself, we're going to make this show. I've never had that. How before. cool. And it's a, the guy who started Chippendales, the gentleman who started Chippendales, and there's nefarious stuff. Uh, around him, so it's yeah, a pretty. You know. People don't know this. So Chippendales, the male stripping thing, that's obviously a very, very funny, memorable SNL sketch about it with, uh, with Chris, Chris Farley. Farley and, <laughs> uh, I didn't even think of that. That's the first time I haven't thought of that when I heard Chippendales. Yeah, mm-hmm. I just think of hot guys. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> Patrick Swayze, hot guys. Speaking of hot stud, guys. crushed um, it. Uh, so when with Chippendales, it's like. It, you're talking about the guy that actually started it. This the is the guy what who started yeah. it was this Indian immigrant uh, who was this like sort of fat, nerdy Indian immigrant. Um, he started Chippendales, and the story itself is wild. Um, there's people don't know this. There's murder and stuff involved. The first like few years of Chippendale, uh, it, it's it's really a lot of nefarious stuff that happens in it. It's really, really crazy, intense stuff that happens in it. People get, multiple people get murdered. This dude was setting fire to other, like male strip clubs were popping up that were copying Chippendales. He started setting fire to them. And he got away with this stuff for years and years and years. And so this story is a really, really I couldn't believe it. So much, like 20 crazy things happen in it that are unbelievable. Is it like a series or a straight movie? It's just uh, eight episodes. It's a short series, eight yeah. episodes, uh, November 22nd. We come out with two episodes. The cast is amazing. It's Murray Bartlett, who just mm-hmm. won an Emmy for White Lotus. Juliet Lewis is in it. Um, mm-hmm. The Ashford, Great. who's really, really wonderful. What are From the- Ashford and Simpson. Yeah. <laughs> no, that's a different back. one. So can we touch on I mean you, you, between these two you hosted <laughs> SNL and then The Eternals. Yeah. And I know it's probably like a sore spot people go, "Hey, you got so muscular." You know, is that like just a dead horse at this point when you hear that? Well, no, because it is weird to sort of what it helped me do and it really did. And I think you guys probably relate well, to this at some level. Yeah, I mean, well, I relate as you can see. I was tired of being known as the most strongest comic. I I only I have <laughs> Spade most is scrappy. Strong. I'll scrappy. fight because when I fight, all I'm gonna think is my dad left me as a kid and all the anger is gonna come out. So someone's gonna get it. All you of have it nothing together. to lose when you so nothing tell, to lose. Come on, what was that? What was your mental state about that? Right, about that becoming a different physical person. What it helped me do was when you're in this, when you're a comedy actor in this business, it's very easy to be put in a box, you know? So all the stuff I did, I was sort of like the funny nerdy guy, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, And what that allowed me to do was break out of that. I don't mean necessarily become an action star or anything. It just had people, had people who give you jobs, see me as not, just a nerd. So the actual mm-hmm. opportunities I started getting from that were not specifically action opportunities. I started getting opportunities to play like normal non-nerdy. People. Just different. Yeah. yeah. So that, that but, makes yeah. sense. But, but yeah. the actual biggest jump there was big sick. And then Eternals is such a jump. But once you get an offer like that, or someone sees you like that, obviously you probably said, I'm going to do my best. 
and I'm going to make sure they didn't make a mistake. I'm going to work out. I'm going to look the part. But what a huge flattering opportunity to be in a movie like that. A Marvel, when I'd like to be in one. Yeah. If they're listening, I'll play a character. I don't know if I could jack up, but what I'm interested in is because then you you do this and it helps you get out of typecasting. Yeah. But then you're still walking around as that because I went, I lift the weights a little bit, you know. I, I still, I did push-ups yesterday. I mean, I do do things. But if you get to a low body fat and a high lean mass, then you're going to walk around different with, and your libido is going to go way up because any kind of little fat around the middle, you know, is not an inert uh, thing in your body. It affects your hormones. So I'm just curious about you as a person, that transition to that kind of fitness, just walking around that powerful, how, how are you feeling about it? It's like, That's it must be fun. It's a very good question. I don't feel any different in terms of how I think of myself. I don't mm -hmm. feel that I am a different person at all. Um, I do feel on a base level stronger. You know, bags are less heavy. If I do groceries, mm -hmm. it's not mm -hmm. as hard. The libido thing is very real. It's mm -hmm. suddenly, um, it shifts. Um, you know, yep. the way my wife, she's always loved me, but the way... She talks about <laughs> my body now is different. Well, what do you What do you mean? What do you mean by she that? She went from like <laughs> to love. Okay, cool. Yeah, what, she what do you, finally. What do you mean? She finally said, "I love you." What's <laughs> That's that? great. Well, Maria Shriver used to say that when she would get in bed, it was, she would get in bed, Arnold would get in bed, and then his body was there. It was like a threesome. Yeah. So it's like you know, it's it's come on, it's you and wife, and then and then wash board abs i mean i guess women like touching them i don't know i've never had that problem <laughs> she said initially it was so funny she said when we when i first got in shape and we would have sex she was like it kind of feels like fucking the corner of a building <laughs> <laughs> i've heard that <laughs> it's so it, i was I, you know everything <laughs> like hard yeah um but every now and then still if i like take my shirt off she'll just be like jesus christ it, oh yeah she knows me a certain way. And so to see just me just look differently, look different, it's still surprising to her. It's so yeah. interesting because, uh, you know, we're interviewing, we're talking today, and you're the exact same person. It's just interesting to be married to someone who does a physical transformation like that. Mm -hmm. So you physically, you're looking at a different person. Yes. And uh, and I guess it's a real turn on. I'm a, you know, I may, I'm going to, I'm not saying I'm going to get like you are, but I'm going to double down. What well, Emily seeing me and doing this uh, about a year and a half ago started weight training herself and it's completely changed. It's completely changed her body and how she feels about her body. Like she's got like muscles now she's got biceps and stuff. It's, it's really interesting. Um, and she sees what I get out of it. I get a lot out of just the working, the process of working out specifically. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, it's, it's helped me with my anxiety. Obviously, you know, we're comics. I assume we all have anxiety. For me, anxiety yeah. is something that always requires management. Working out helps with that. I sleep. Incredible. Yeah. Sleep better? Yeah. So yeah. All that's, sleeping has always been an issue for me, and now I sleep better. Obviously, it's still hard sometimes. You know, I didn't sleep well last night, but... Hard to shut your mind off kind of thing? Yeah, you yeah, look like you shit. lay in bed. You think about all the things that could have been and all these things you're going to fuck up in the future. <laughs> all the regrets. Yeah. yeah. All right, Dan. I think we have to let him go because. Uh, oh, we uh, have another they, one coming. No, up he's being guys, very cool. You guys are so great. I'm such a fan of both of you, and this was such a thrill for me to do. Thank you for having me on. Uh, it was an absolute pleasure. I just enjoyed it as a conversation, and yeah, the way it bounced around very was great. Honest, authentic, down to earth dude. I think it's very fun talking to you. I don't know you at all. It's great to sit here, and this is a great hour with you. And uh, we really appreciate it. It's going to be people are going to love to hear from you. They heard from you part of it, right? It was mostly me and Dana, but it's no. But I, I think that that's. I'm sorry. <laughs> well, I'm just a fan, so that was really interesting to me. So, so thank you for sharing those stories. As well, well, we love people asking us questions because we're fundamentally flawed. I mean, for for interviewers, we both have narcissistic yeah. tendencies. So when you started saying, "Hey, Dana, what about this?" You know, my brain lit up. I, mean, I got yeah. an endorphin rush. No, it's we, more <laughs> like dinner. We all just talk, and everyone talks. It's, it's a not just a hard interview. It's not sixty minutes. You know, it's. But I obviously... think our view people who don't know you or they know about you this will this will be a fun conversation for them yeah, to listen to for sure you know especially ending on the high libido thing 
two people are in their 40s, really fit, having a lot of sex. <laughs> Talking about their wives <laughs> fucking sides of buildings. Yeah, I, yeah, I want to. I want so. <laughs> my wife said, "You're like I feel like I'm fucking a delicatessen." I'm like, wow. <laughs> How? How? Deli meat section. Yeah. No, yeah. She listens to this podcast. She'll be laughing. All right. Yeah. Sorry, Thanks, honey. Guys. Thank you. So Thanks, thank you, buddy. Thanks. Take care. Bye. Talk to you later. Bro. Awkward. Leave. Hey, what's up, flies? What's up, fleas? What's up, people that listen? We want to hear from you and your dumb questions. Questions, ask us anything. Anything you want. You can email us at flyonthewall at cadence13.com. Oh, we have questions. Joseph. I like, okay. I like when he calls. Nicknames. My nickname now for, from Joseph Bettina. What is Botino. Botino. I'm going to think it's Botino. It's Han, it says Hans and Spudley. So I'm Hans of Hans and Franz, and you're Spudley from... From Dennis Miller. Spudley. Spudley. Uh, okay, I heard a rumor that Lorne insisted... This is a good question. Lorne insisted that his movie posters be set against a background of blue sky and white clouds. Never would have thought of that in a million years. Hmm. Tommy Boy, Black Sheep, both Wayne's World, Coneheads, Ladies Man, Superstar. Huh. All do this. Is it true? I guess it's true if you just said it. And did he explain himself? I would never I think that. I never put that, that must together, be a trick. Joseph. It must be some sort of testing that says that makes you happy. It's a, you a psychological thing for the audience that the box office will go sky high. And so you have works. a sky background. That's I, all I could think of. Yeah. I don't, I'm still not sure this is true. Joseph, is this a let's, trick question? Let's look at a clip. No, let's no call clips. Lauren. Hello, um, yes, who's this? Guys, we we varied the clouds. Dana, you you're know. cutting out. <laughs> this better be important. Uh, Lauren, yes, it's about Coneheads. What? I'm putting on a show this week. Yeah, but we need to know about the background of Ladies Man and Superstar. Um, I'm going to hang up now. <laughs> <laughs> but I love you both. No, I'm going to put Marcy on. I'll come on the podcast soon again. Marcy, he's got it's hey. Dana. He's got some questions. <laughs> <laughs> so, are we answering Joseph's Patino's question that he already knows Spudley? the answer to? Uh, I, he's asking if Lauren is it true ever explained this. No, he didn't. But I like this. I think it's a very interesting observation because mm -hmm. it might be true. It seems to have helped because I've heard of all those movies, so that means something worked, right? Yeah, I. I have no opinion. I don't. I. I don't know if Lauren did it. I don't know if the posters there's look like that. There's some method to the madness. They have to do that for. You know how the word trick goes with question. Track. It's a trick question. You know when we are in. Uh, this is the last thing we are in read through, in Schneider. <laughs> ah. If you go, and uh, a garbage man comes into the scene, uh, played by Ken Among, and everyone laughs. And Schneider goes trick, trick, laugh. That's not a real laugh. That won't get a laugh on the show. <laughs> don't kill. <laughs> well, he has to call it out because you know it's what not I mean? a, the audience wouldn't know who Kenny is. Right, Among it's a read-through trick that we say trick some inside question. joke, and then it gets a big laugh, and he goes, make sure you negate. <laughs> <laughs> like, don't count on that on the show. I won't get a laugh. It's furious. Flips over his pizza. One slice. Flip. All right, that's it. Thank you for the question, and uh, keep them coming. This has been a podcast presentation of Cadence 13. Please listen, then rate, review, and follow all episodes. Available now for free wherever you get your podcast. No joke, folks. Fly on the Wall has been a presentation of Cadence 13. Executive produced by Dana Carvey and David Spade, Chris Corcoran of Cadence 13, and Charlie Finan of Brillstein Entertainment. The show's lead producer is Greg Holtzman with production and engineering support from Serena Regan and Chris Basil of Cadence 13. 